point of no return. Now you know why Obama is doing everything he can to flood America with mainly single males of military age from Syria. Now, doesn't logic dictate that amongst these so-called Syrian refugees, a small percentage will eventually, or they're active jihadists or will become so? Wouldn't even the most progressive amongst you admit that? So you're bringing in, let's say, 100,000. It's going to be much higher than unless he stopped through some kind of act by Congress to stop this madman before it's too late. Let's say it's 100,000. Use it as, a, as an easy number to work with. So let's say the number we're told of Muslims who are radicalized is 1%. Now, 1% of 100,000 is how many? Come on, can you do the math? Robert, you could do the math. 1% of, of 1,000 is what? What's 1% of, of 10? <laughs> one, okay. 1% 1 of 10 is 1. What's 1% what's of 100? 1% of 100 is 1, not 1% 1 of 10. 1% 1 of 100 is 1. So 1% 1 of 100,000 is 1,000. So look at what two of them did. You're telling me we can afford 1,000 jihadists in this country? Excuse me, 1,000 more? Look what two of them just did. Look at the mayhem that two radical Muslims just did. And look what it just did to our nation. So you're telling me we can afford 1,000 of them amongst the Syrians? Because the best analysis is that it's only 1% of them who might be radical or become radicalized in time. Can we afford 50 more of these massacres? I'm doing the math for you. I'm using Aristotelian logic. I'm using analysis that even a child can do. I'm using an analysis that a six-year-old who has a brain could do. And any sane nation would say, no, we can't afford it. No, we don't want it. We're not bringing them in. Even though I was a good liberal yesterday, I'm not a good liberal today. I'm a sane liberal who wants to live. I don't want him here. I don't want him here. No, no immigrants, no Syrian immigrants, no immigrants from Muslim countries until we sort out the Muslims amongst us who have recently come in, which ones of those are liable to go off like a rocket tomorrow. Why is anything I am saying offensive? I want to know if anyone out there finds anything I'm saying offensive and why. What is offensive about survival? Is there something offensive about survival? It's crazy. You know, we used to be blessed in this country with isolation because of where the continent is and very secure borders until we were invaded from within by Barack Hussein Obama and the people who put him in power. I remember reading years ago when I was a kid that we were protected from the scourges of Nazism because we had an ocean between us and Hitler. And we were protected from the scourges of communism because we had an ocean between us and Russia and China. I used to have a certain sense of comfort in that. And then I would say, you know, it's true. Then I said, well, we have borders and every cell, whether it be plant or animal, has a cell wall or a cell membrane. That's what keeps the cell together. The borders are our essential protection against invasion. That's what borders were created for. And then I wake up and everything has gone out the window. Every commonsensical method of protecting the population has been dismembered by this demonic individual in the White House. And I rest my case on that point. It's all him. He is demonic. He is doing it to us. He is open about it. You could look at him and see it. There's not a person who has a brain who can't see right through him. Unfortunately, there are only too many people. There are not too many people with the ability to even look at reality and see what's going on. Just listen to the dunces in the media, both during and after this horrific event, and you'll see the danger we are in. I'll be back in a minute to take your calls right here on the Savage Nation. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or Swiss America. In the past, what, 10, 11 years, more than 2,000 terror suspects have bought guns in the U.S. 91% of all suspected terrorists who try to buy a gun in a store in America walked away with his or her weapon of choice. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you for the edification on guns. You're such an expert because you have 
Secret Service bodyguards. You don't need guns. I'm sure you have some in your house that were legally purchased, but we shouldn't have them because you're better than everybody. You're superior to everybody. You live on Pacific Heights. You know, you can do anything you want, and you don't, you know, we don't need guns. We, the people on the bottom of the hill. So they're trying, as we speak, to uh, take away your right to bear arms. Now, look, we all know that these people had no right to buy guns, but they bought them anyway. And you say, well, what do you mean these people? What do you mean by these people had no right? Don't, don't, aren't they American citizens? Well, he was. But the FBI admitted today that he was in contact with a known terrorist. Sympathizer, they didn't do anything. Why didn't they break his door down and pull him out by his hair and throw him into a dark cell and find out what the heck he was doing? Why didn't they break into his garage before the bombs were pulled out? Why didn't they take his guns away before he used them in that handicap center? He was on a watch list. They didn't do anything. So we don't need gun control, but we need as a new leader of DHS, for example, new rules of engagement, new laws written to protect us from these maniacs, so the next Farig Zawul or whatever doesn't do it again. You know, but I am waiting for the media to cover this narrative because it's very disturbing to me. Where is the outrage for the excessive force that was used yesterday by the San Bernardino police and the FBI? I mean, to a liberal, this was quite upsetting. Don't Muslim lives matter? Weren't their hands up? Don't shoot in the car? Weren't they just running from the fear of these white males with, with these big tanks? I mean, did the police kill these two Muslims in cold blood? I want to know why Ayatollah Sharpton is not out there edifying this situation for us. We need Ayatollah Sharpton on the ground in San Bernardino to explain why the police use such excessive force on this poor newlywed couple, this innocent immigrant couple with such a darling baby that they dropped off at that sweetheart of a grandmother. We must close this outrageous loophole. Three times this week, Republicans overwhelmingly voted to protect terror suspects' ability to buy lethal firearms. The most recent time within the past hour when our, our motion... Uh, you know, this is a dying nation. The There's no better example of this being a dying nation than this octogenarian senile case holding such a very powerful position, and after such a terrible tragedy such as this, attacking not Muslim immigrants, attacking not CAIR, attacking not the DHS failures, attacking not the FBI failures, attacking not the president himself for permitting this open-door policy to put us all at risk, but attacking guns. <clears throat> what senility? A senile old woman like this and her friend there, the sister on Pacific Heights, Diane Feinstein, another genius, another octogenarian, the Senate Intelligence Committee, no less, an old woman, afraid of guns on the, on the Senate Intelligence Committee, not a returning military veteran in the Senate. No, no, the strange queen of diamonds. WBOB Chris, welcome to the Savage Nation. Yes, Dr. Savage. Um, it's hard to listen to the, the daily news events that are caused by uh, insane people committing and enab enabling atrocities uh, who are detached from reality. And I really hate for this to sound like a kiss-up type of thing. I listen to a lot of talk radio, and I like yours a lot because it engages my mind differently than the other people. Um, Sometimes you use older words like valise that probably no one knows what that means anymore. <laughs> very, very <laughs> funny. That words. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you, you paint a picture with your comments and it kind of parallels the words. Not just, it's kind of hard to describe, but I can see a picture in my mind as you're talking about people sometimes. Um, okay, let me, let me explain. First of all, thank you for the compliments. And number two, I have explained before <clears throat> that I speak in pictographic terms. I am the only person in radio, maybe in television as well, <clears throat> who speaks in pictograms. And it's a product both of my thinking and my language. But I speak pictographically. 
The Chinese language is a language of pictograms. You know that, right? That their letters are actually pictures, correct? Yes. We've all heard that. I mean, well, most of us can't read Chinese, but if you go into a Chinese restaurant and you see a Chinese menu, you see little letters, but they don't, you don't know what they mean. They're, they're pictures. Very complicated uh, uh, alphabet. Far more complicated than our English alphabet. And yet they, they paint pictures, in other words. Well, I do that verbally. Just inherently in me. I don't know how that happened. I'm not Chinese. God knows I wish I could read Chinese and write Chinese. I'd eat better Chinese food, but I'm not Chinese. But I, I do speak pictographically. You know what I'm saying, Chris? I understand. And I would be remiss not to tell you that I have a friend who's a physicist, a Ph.D. physicist. He's a brilliant guy. He just read Government Zero, and he said to me, you write like Hemingway. If Hemingway were writing nonfiction, he would write the way you write. He said every word that you write has a meaning. There are no wasted words. I said, I learned that as a, in my early days in science to use as few words as possible to make my point. Use lean language. You know what I'm saying? Maybe that's what appeals to you. I think it's the Well, Chris, all I can say is this is not easy for me to sit through this massacre of America. Obama is uh, overseeing a massacre of America. He reminds me of an Indian chief who sold out to the U.S. cavalry and, and ushered his own people to their, to their slaughter. It reminds me of Indian chiefs who were bought out with wampum and booze, God knows what else, and sold their own Indians down, down the drain. That's what I feel like. I feel like an Indian brave sitting in a village watching the leaders bring in those who would burn my teepee to the ground. That's I understand. Can I? Uh, there, you want some pictograms? I just gave you some. How's that? There's some pictographic language. That is emotionally how I feel. Call me crazy if you'd like. So where do I get my salvation from in days like today? Children called me yesterday, very intelligent people. They asked me, Dad, how are you dealing with all this? You're on the front lines of it. You have to deal, do, deal with this every day. How are you dealing with it? They know I don't take a break from it 24-7. Ask anyone who knows me. I don't take a break from it, not for a second. It'll kill an ordinary man. But there's an old saying, that which does not kill you will make you stronger. I've gotten stronger as the years have gone on dealing with this cancer of liberalism. Liberalism is a mental disorder, and the disease is now endemic in the country. I don't think there's an aspect of our society that has not been poisoned by this mental thinking. This lack of ability to reason, this lack of ability to connect the dots and see where their thinking leads, where their policies have led us and are leading us to our own doom. Well, I'll tell you, I get my salvation through a couple of different ways. One of them is through nature. In one of the dwellings that I reside in, do my show, I live right near the water. I live near San Francisco Bay. And when things get really hectic for me, I stand right next to the water, and I watch the birds feed. I watch the seals when they're around. I watch the different species of birds hunting, for, fishing together, and they don't kill each other, which always amazes me. I see giant pelicans recently. They come in only very, 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 very seldom do they appear. Mainly it's seagulls here all the time. And then the, and the various and others be the sand. The, no, no sandpipers here. But there are different species of birds. But nevertheless, the point is that when they're fishing, they don't peck each other. <clears throat> Through eons of evolution together, they've learned how to coexist. Now, why would you bring in one brand of humanity that has never gotten along with its neighbor. Not in its, in its, its history of a 1,400 years has there not been warfare between this species and its neighbor. Wherever you look on earth, they don't like the Hindus. There was a civil war in India. They broke off a piece of India and created a country called Pakistan. You don't even know the history of that. The Muslims were at war with the Hindus for one grievance or another. They couldn't get along with the Hindus, so... Gandhi decided to do something very noble. I'll tell you what, we'll give the Muslims a whole piece of India. Called, we'll call it Pakistan. A million people died in the uh, relocation during this little peaceful uh, re relocation. And one million people killed each other. Hindus, Muslims, it was a nightmare. But then they figured, all right, it's all over now. They have Pakistan, they'll be nice and happy. No, they've been at war with India since Pakistan was created because they have a grievance over uh, a disputed region, 
Oh, yeah, there's still a problem. Ask the Hindus about their experience. Now let's go.